Hi guys, how you doing? I wanted to just sort of recap a few things uh, on the fashion sourcing uh, assignment. Uh, overall, the fashion sourcing assignments I received were pretty good, but they were missing a lot of stuff, and a lot of them were kind of missing a lot of important information or um, felt like didn't really understand the information of the fabric and, and why it was important or 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 it wasn't a lot of comprehension on what a fashion sourcing list is or a fabric sourcing list um, is supposed to be. This should be fabric sourcing. Sorry about that. So um, I just wanted to take a minute to sort of revisit the assignment and kind of go over some of the areas that I thought needed improvement on a whole. And of course, this is not to point out anybody. And, and when I do see these things happen on a whole, it's usually probably my fault for not being clear about it. And a lot of things with the textiles um, and, and some things with this course, I'm going to assume you have knowledge of because this is an advanced course. It is, in fact, the most advanced course that we have. Um, so I am assuming some things. Um, so what I want to do is, is, again, just sort of revisit this assignment and kind of pinpoint certain aspects that I felt weren't really comprehended um, when reviewing the assignments. And again, this doesn't apply to everybody. This was just sort of a general um, feeling that I got uh, from the majority of the assignments. Not all, but the majority. So let's revisit the fabric sourcing assignment. First, I want to really emphasize what sourcing means. And this was probably the biggest thing that I saw in your assignments that I was I was really shocked. I had I'd never really seen it in other semesters, but you really didn't understand what sourcing means. Um, it's so here's the definition. Um, it's a noun. It refers to economic practices or uh, corporate practices. And it's the buying of components from of a product from an outside supplier, one often located abroad, not always. So basically what it means is I'm a company and I need certain components to create my product. And I'm going to buy or purchase those components from somebody else. Um, in our case, when we're talking about fabric sources, we are a fashion company looking to purchase fabric from either a textile mill or a fabric distributor, okay? Um, and they would be third-party connectors. Those fabric distributors are usually third-party connectors that connect fashion companies or designers with textile mills or they uh, act as such. The two most important aspects of sourcing anything are price and vendor. Sourcing basically incorporates the fact that you're going to find prices and vendors of these components needed to create your product. So specifically for fashion, if I say I'm going to source fabric for a designer or for a fashion company, that means I'm going to find prices and vendors. Um, the amount of fabric sourcing assignments I received that did not include the price of the fabric was way too high. Um, and it's necessary. And I think, again, that's a little bit my fault because the language used in the assignment handout um, was sort of, you know, find the list the available information. I should have been much um, more rigid in saying exactly everything that I needed to know. Um, and I just really want to emphasize here that when you source anything for anybody, the two most important aspects of that sourcing is finding a price and a vendor. Okay? So um, I'll use that left price and vendor out, tisk tisk tisk, but maybe a little bit of tisk tisk on me too. Now, I also want to go over fabric information. For the most part, your fabric information was pretty good. Um, some better than others. Um, but I know for
for the most of you, and this is fine, that it was probably a lot of copy pasta, but I also just want to really make sure that you guys understand the fabric information that comes um, in the description of the fabric, wh what it means, why it's important. Um, it's so, so important um, to know about our fabrics and know about our fabric information as designers. Um, I have used this sort of metaphor before, but it's a lot like a chef and their ingredients. Um, fabrics and materials are our ingredients. And if you go to a restaurant and the chef comes out, or you know, someone's cooking you dinner, and they say, I have meat on the menu. And you sort of say, okay, well, um, uh, what kind of meat? You know, that could be a lot of things. Is it dog meat? Or is it Wagyu beef? You know, I don't know, I wanna know. And you ask the chef, well, what kind of meat is it? And he says, well, I don't know. Well, that's not gonna make you think really highly of that chef. That's so similar to what we do in fashion. If I ask you someone what kind of fabric it is and they say cotton, and I say, well, what kind of cotton? You know, there's about, th there's only about thousands, if not millions, of different types of cotton fabrics. Is it knit? Is it woven? Is it a chenille knit? Is it a chambray? Is it a chali? Is it uh, poplin? Is it broadcloth? Is it um, a sateen? Is it, you know, what, what is it? What's the weave? What's the yarn? What's the finish? Is it, you know, what are all these things? Cotton tells me nothing. It tells me as much about the fabric as if I tell you you're going to eat meat. Okay, it gives me a vague description of the contents, but not really enough to make it appetizing. Um, and that's what you want to do. You want to make your fabric appetizing. You want to serve someone, you know, uh, a two-plied 110 count uh, uh, broadcloth um, instead uh, with mercerized cotton um, instead of serving them cotton. Um, in the same way as you want to serve someone dry-aged prime rib beef from Angus cow uh, instead of serving someone meat, questionable meat. Um, or if you're vegetarian, you know, <laughs> the vegetarian example is I have vegetable. Well, what vegetable? Is it kale? Is it broccoli? Is it asparagus? Well, I don't know. It's green. Um, it's, it's not enough. You got to make it appetizing and it's really important because, um, ignorance on fabric is really going to expose your deficiencies as a fashion designer very quickly. It is very important for you to know your materials and to know fabric as a designer or to be eligible or valuable to any fashion company. And the less you know about fabrics, the quicker it is going to be exposed. And it, it, is, it is really um, a deterrent um, for people to look at you as a competent person in the apparel or design industry. So fabric information. In addition to the price and vendor, so when you're going out and finding information for a fashion company or a designer or for yourself, um, in a sort of industrial way or an industry standard way, in addition to that price and vendor, um, fashion designers need to know the following fabric information. They need to know its width, they need to know the weight or yarn gauge, they need to know the weave or knit type, and they need to know specific fiber content. Okay, and I'm going to go into each one of those things more specifically so you understand what they are. But these are absolutely necessary pieces of information that you need to have. In addition to the absolutely necessary stuff, there's additional fabric information that it can be very useful. It's not always necessary. Uh, not always necessary It's because it's not always applied or relevant to every fabric type. But if it is, it's certainly important to know it. Um, and also not 100% sometimes necessary as it's sort of just additional and useful, um, but again, not absolutely mandatory. And that can be yarn type, which again, yarn type is more on, it sort of crosses the line. It's, it's somewhat necessary depending on how particular the yarn type is, uh, finishes. And again, finishes is necessary when it's present um, because not all fabric is finished, but if it is finished, I should know how it's finished. 
country of origin and then typically other um, uh, information. And that could be a wide range of different categories of information. There's so many different aspects and characteristics to fabric. Um, we can pick up any sort of little unique detail if we feel it is important to the fabric. And how do we know if it's important? Well, if it um, affects how the fabric is cost, how it looks like, or how it performs, then it's always pretty necessary to know about. Okay, so let's go over those absolutely necessary pieces of information. And the first one is width. And you guys should know what this is by now. Um, so when we talk about a fabric width, it is how wide the fabric was woven to be. So in the little example here, we have the roll of fabric. Um, basically, it comes out of the, um, uh, the loom and gets rolled around and we can set pretty much how wide it is and then it just keeps weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving so the length is quite long um, or to a specified length and the width is basically just how wide that strip of fabric is going to be uh, and the width of woven fabrics is always measured along the cross grain and for woven fabrics fabrics usually come in one of two standard widths although there are variations and that is typically a smaller narrow width of 44 to 45 inches or a wider width of 60 uh, inches. Now there are variations of this because of course there's many different types of looms that can create many different widths. These are just the typical two that we um, find. Now this is very important to know uh, the width of the fabric because it's going to inform us of how much yardage we need. So if I have a narrow width of 44 uh, inches, I am typically going to need more yardage to create, say, 100 garments out of this fabric than I am from a 60 inch because it's wider. I'll need less yardage in the 60 inch uh, width, again, because it simply is wider, so there's more fabric per yard um, of linear length, okay? So that is why width is important. It will help to inform our purchase, our final purchasing um, of this fabric when it comes time for the bulk purchase when we are going to make all of our garments, okay? And again, we'll need more yardage for the 44 and less for the 60. Now, typically 60s will be a little bit more expensive um, per yard because again, it's wider, there's more fabric. Okay, fabric weight chart. The weight of a fabric is very important. So this is literally how heavy a fabric is. And I'm sorry, this is like a, like a weird shadow to it. I'm not sure how I applied that. Oop, let me go back, sorry. Um, so again, literally how heavy a fabric it is. And it's measured a few different ways. Um, the three kind of most standard are we're going to see ounces per square yard or O's slash Y or O's OPY um, or OPSY or something like that, um, but that's ounces per square yard. Uh, next we have, that's our imperial units. Uh, next we have our metric units, um, grams per square meter, uh, GSM, and then we have the mummy. Um, and this is used only for silks. And the mummy is a very ancient um, Asian unit of weight specifically derived to weigh silks. And it's typically for very light to kind of medium heavy silks. Um, and fabric weight will give us an idea of the density, thickness, and warmth of a fabric. So that's why it's important to know it um, because it's gonna inform how appropriate it is for certain garments. Um, do you want something light, airy, breathable, and flowy? Well, you better get something light, um, literally light. So on the four ounce per square yard um, around there, or we can go up um, more if you want it to be durable and maybe uh, very warm, um, we're gonna increase that density in weight. So um, here's just a, a, a rough overview of uh, grams per square meter and ounces per square meter and sort of generally what they're gonna apply to from very, very thin, light fabrics to thicker fabrics. And of course, you can get even more of this. So this, this is really for 
you know, the heaviest of your cotton wovens, but when you get into really thick wooly, uh, maybe even sweatpants uh, material or, or thick wooly sweater material or really thick, thick wools like Melton's or, or thick felts, um, you're going to get even more than this. But this gives you a general idea of where different fabrics are going to fall uh, as according to weight. Weave type. Weave type. Everybody needs to brush up on their weave types. Everybody, 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 everybody. Um, weave is a really, really important aspect of understanding fabrics. Woven fabrics, of course. We'll talk about knits in a minute. Um, but the weave type of a fabric gives really important information on its appearance, durability, and how it will function in a garment. Um, there are many variants but there are three basic weave types and every variant will fall within one of these weave types except for jacquard which is kind of a, a, a weird sort of step cousin but I'll get to that in a minute. The three basic weave types are plain, twill, and satin. Okay so here I have an indication of a plain weave and it's a basic over under over under. We take each cross grain and each length grain and basically just alternate it going over under over under and you can see that in the illustration. The greens are our weft and the purple are our warp. Um, it goes over one, under a warp, over a warp, under a warp, over a warp, under a warp. And if we take the warp the purple and follow it vertically, it goes under a weft, over a weft, under a weft, over a weft, uh, so on and so forth in this sort of checkerboard pattern. Now there are variants uh, of the plain weave, many, many different variants, um, just like there are variants of every one of our three basic weave types. And one of them is here, it's the basic basket weave. We still have that basic over under pattern, but now we're just grouping the yarns into twos. So these two yarns are acting like the one yarns are here, going over, under, over, under, their re respective either warp or cross grains. Here we have a twill weave, and this is our basic standard, and it goes um, over two, or over, in this instance, over three. Again, those are two different variants. This example has over three, one, two, three, and under one. Typically, it's over two, under one, um, but we'll let that be for now. Um, and it creates this sort of diagonal ribbing pattern. So if you look at your denim, denim is a twill weave. And uh, you've ever wondered what's making that little kind of diagonal ribbing? It's very subtle, um, but you'll see it in lots of different fabrics. You'll see it chinos, um, denims, um, uh, different fabrics like that. Uh, it will have that tight, gabardines have it, um, that tight little, um, Diagonal ribbing, it's a twill weave. Now just to sort of summarize, twill weaves um, are the strongest and most durable weave. So that's why we are gonna see fabrics that are known for their durability and strength like denim um, and chino and, and lots of canvases and, and things like that will be that twill weave because it's very strong and durable. Plain weave is your most common um, and we're gonna see that in shirtings like poplins and broadcloths um, chambrays and things like that. Now our herringbone is a in houndstooth are what is called a twill variant or a broken twill. Um, and just like we have variants like the basket weave of the plain weave, the herringbone and houndstooth weave are variants of the twill weave. And they basically play with breaking up or changing around that over two or over three under one pattern um, and create different patterns with it. So in the herringbone weave, we basically reverse the direction of that patterning and we get the that little diagonal ribbing coming down and then going up and then going down and coming up and these little V shapes uh, that look like the bones of a herring. I've never seen the bones of a herring, but I'll take their word for it. Um, now, houndstooth, um, <laughs> I have seen a hound's tooth, and I don't think it looks like a hound's tooth, but again, we'll take their word for it. But it's created in a similar way as the herringbone is, and it breaks up that twill pattern. Now, it's a little less apparent, um, but 
that's how we do it. We sort of switch around um, what yarns are going over two and under one, and we vary that twill weave to get this little check. It's a hound's tooth check. It's very, very conic, just like the herringbone weave is. Um, you've seen it before, I know you have, and now you know how it's created. It's actually so popular that, I mean, traditionally it's, it's a woven in design, accented by two different colored yarns, so typically black and white, but of course you can have it any color. Um, uh, but it's so popular, a Czech pattern, that I, I've even seen it printed, um, not woven. So that's interesting. Um, up here we have the satin weave. And the satin weave is very much like the twill weave where we float or go over um, lots of different ones. And with the satin weave, it's at least here showing three, um, but it's really three, four, or even five floats. So you get these very long sort of stretches of yarn floating over. And what the satin weave does is because it has so many floats and it has these really long stretches of yarn that don't go under um, their corresponding sort of cross yarn, whether it be length or uh, weft, because we can flow our satin weaves in either the uh, weft or, or warp direction, is these long stretches of yarn that don't get interrupted um, is what really accents that shiny surface. So what we associate with satin, now satin is a weave, it is not a fabric, although you wouldn't sometimes know that at a lot of fabric stores because they'll just lump it into together, but don't make that mistake. Um, satins are known for their shiny surfaces. Um, and this is how they're created with these long sort of floating yarns. Um, in our typical satins, we'll see, um, you know, either a duchess satin or a pot de soie or a charmeuse um, or anything that's created with these or even a sateen, which is a cotton example. Um, typically, satins are going to be silk or a synthetic, um, but that's not true. Anything that has the satin weave is technically a satin, like a sateen is a cotton with the satin weave, and it does give a little bit of a shinier surface. Cotton isn't as inherently shiny as silk, but it has a bit of a bit of a gloss, bit of a glow. Again, not that high gloss or high shine that we see in a charmeuse, um, but it's there. Now, um, satin's very beautiful, and we weave it this way for that luxurious sort of loose flow and um, uh, primarily for shine, but because we're floating it so much, it actually makes it very, very weak. So satin is a very weak fabric, um, very delicate, and it's not gonna be as durable as our plain and certainly not as durable as our sort of, our, our tough, tough twill. Um, now, I also have a jacquard down here. Oops, sorry about that. Getting ahead of myself. A jacquard down here. Now jacquards um, are fun little fabrics that can combine every type of weave. So they combine plain weaves, twill weaves, and satin weaves. And they do it in a manner to create beautiful patterns, textured patterns woven directly into a fabric. So here's sort of a close up of a jacquard area and you can see they're floating um, using plain, using floats, using twills. Um, to create patterns. And this, obviously, it's not the same fabric, but this is an example of a woven jacquard. We have this beautiful pattern. It is not printed. It is woven into the fabric by varying uh, or switching between plain tweave and satin weaves. It creates this lovely texture. Brocade is a very good example of, of a jacquard fabric. Now, the name of some fabrics will indicate what weave it is made from, but the fiber or known never indicates weave type. So you might be confused why some, I sort of nitpicked about some of your fabrics other, uh, more than others. So if you say something like cotton, cotton gives me no clue what the weave type is. In fact, it doesn't even tell me whether it's woven or knit. You're just telling me the fiber. It gives me literally almost no information. Um, except for fiber content, which is one of the several things that we need to know. Um, so be careful that if you're naming a fabric, that the name means something. Um, for instance, so I gave the example of charmeuse. 
So charmeuse is a specific type of fabric. And within that name charmeuse, it is telling me that it is shiny. Um, it uses the satin weave. Um, and it is going to be of a general weight that is um, a medium light weight, okay? Um, it it's also gives me other information about that specific type of fabric. It's gonna be a, a, a looser uh, twisted wa uh, yarn, which I'll get to later, uh, which makes it fluttery and flowing and loose and limp, uh, not stiff. And we'll get to talk to that a little bit more about yarn type because that has more to do with the stiffness of the fabric um, than we have right here. Um, or say something like I mentioned before, like muslin is always going to be a plain weave otherwise, unless it's otherwise specified as a twill weave muslin, which I have seen. It's more common for plain, but whatever. Um, again, the name denim implies that it's going to be a twill weave. Um, the name poplin implies that it's going to be a plain weave just because that is part of that fa uh, fabric type, that character type. So know the difference between a cotton name like poplin, broadcloth, uh, satin, chambray, um, uh, gabardine, those mean specific things and they mean specific yarn types and they mean specific weave types and they mean specific weights. Something like cotton does not mean any of that. So when you are using a name, know what it means because what it means um, can uh, inform you on the additional information needed. So if a, if, a, if a fabric is just labeled cotton, you're gonna need to tell me the weight, you're gonna need to tell me the weave type, you're gonna need to tell me the yarn type. Um, but if a fabric says, oh, this is poplin, um, that's gonna give me a lot of information already. It's gonna give me weave type, it's gonna give me yarn type, it's gonna give me weight to a certain degree, or at least a general idea of what it's going to be. Um, okay, knit type. So just like with wovens, knit fabrics have an array of different types of patterns that can be knit, uh, it knit in. Uh, one knit fabric can actually utilize many different knit patterns within its composition. So we can switch from any sort of different knit pattern to another one within that same piece of cloth. Um, and this is has to do with the way um, fabric is knitted um, and our ability to individualize each knit stitch. So very basically our plain knits, just your basic knit uh, is going to have knits. These are the knit stitch on the face side and purl stitching on the back or wrong side. Um, now knit stitches are formed and knit are sort of, knit and purls are formed in tandem. Um, knit stitches are made and this is what the face looks like and this is what the back of it like looks like. And that's why our knit stitches, these little V's or hearts, cute little, cute little hearts, we love our knits. Um, are going to be on the face. And of course, on the back of the knit stitch, we have these kind of more kind of blobby, uh, I, I call them a little bit of a U, but I guess, you know, um, they're more sort of just sort of oval shaped, roughly, are gonna be our pearls. Now we alternate what stitch is showing on the face side to create a number of different designs. And we can do different techniques to create different textures and really, the amount of knit patterns are endless. Just Google it. This is just a small fraction of the knit uh, patterns that are out there. Um, there's so, so many. And, you know, as a designer, especially if you're interested in knits, um, it's, it's very good to get a little bit more familiar with some of the more basic ones. I mean, like I said, this is probably the most basic, which is just having the knit stitches on the front and having the purl stitches on the back. Uh, the second most uh, popular is we're gonna see a rib stitch. And the rib stitch alternates the knits and the purls and the numerical value given to a rib tells us how many knit stitches to how many purl stitches. So this is a one by one rib. That means one knit stitch, one purl stitch. And that creates this sort of little valley in between. So when we think about rib stitches, we think about these sort of um, textured stripes that arise from how we stitch the knit fabric. So this is one by one, so one knit, one purl, one knit, 
one pearl, one knit, one pearl, and the pearls again are going to be that sort of valley to the uh, rib, um, and the knits are going to be the sort of higher raised up texture part, and we can do this in a lot of different ways. So if I have a two by two rib, that would be two knit stitches, two uh, pearl stitches. If I have a two by one rib, that's two knit stitches, one pearl, two knit stitches, one pearl, and just repeats like that. These are a little bit more fancy up here, but again, there's lots of different fancy ones. And again, if you wanna uh, look up some more yourself on the internet, please do. Again, down here, this is just an alternate way to rib uh, with what's called a seed. A seed, seed knit is also a very popular type of knit pattern. Um, if you'd like to see it not ribbed, go Google it. I only have so much room on this slide for so many <laughs> pictures. And like I said, there's, there's literally thousands of knit stitches. Um, fabric information. So uh, specific fiber content. So most of you guys were pretty good about this, um, but where it kind of broke apart was sometimes when there were blended fabric uh, fabrics or blended fibers. So most all fabrics are made up of fibers uh, and there are, you know, some let's say uh, um, exceptions to that, like, you know, leather or um, vinyl or things like that. Um, uh, and it is important to know exactly what the fiber content is of your fabric. Or, you know, it, even if you are working with one of these non-fibrous materials, you need to know what it is. If it's leather, I want to know what from animal it's coming from. And not only what animal it's coming from, but what are the finishes and treatments done to it. Um, so leather is not enough. Is it calf skin? Is it lamb skin? Um, is it embossed? Um, is, has it been treated? Has it been, you know, uh, uh, so many different uh, aspects of it. But again, that's a little bit more um, spe specific than I want to get into right now. Um, so always want to know what the content of your fabric is, and this will affect how it's cared for, how expensive it is, and how it performs. Um, so again, very important for us to know. Um, if the fiber is blended, it's important to know exactly what percentage makeup for each fiber it contains is. So what does that mean? So this is really um, what I saw uh, in the assignment. So, oh, it's cotton poly. Okay, so I know there's polyester and I know there's cotton in it. Fantastic. But what's the breakdown? Is it 50% co cotton, 50% poly? Is it, you know, 5% poly or to 95% cotton? You know, what is it? And uh, this is really important to know because uh, for a couple things. One, it's going to affect how it performs. So the more cotton in that cotton poly blend, the more comfortable, uh, soft, and breathable it's going to be. The more polyester in that blend, uh, the less it's gonna shrink, uh, the less it's gonna wrinkle, um, but it's also going to be less breathable and it's also going to be cheaper. So if you see a relatively expensive cotton poly and it's mostly cotton, you can say, okay, I understand that. But if you see a relatively expensive cotton poly and it's mostly poly, you'll say, well, I don't know if that's really worth it. That's doesn't, poly is supposed to be a very cheap and expensive material. If this fabric is mostly poly, what's really, why am I paying so much? It must be overpriced. So it helps us sort of, it, it informs us on those decisions that we need to make. Um, so let us know again in your fiber information. Don't just say, you know, it's a cotton poly or it's a silk rayon or it's a, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, wool acrylic or whatever, um, let me know exactly what the, the fiber breakdown is. And this is, again, very important. Yarn types. So um, the yarns that are actually woven or knit into our fabrics uh, really contribute a lot to how the fabric looks, feels, and performs. And we can sort of put things into different categories on, on uh, performance and look and uh, just sort of general texture. Um, so there are a number of different specialty yarn types that give a distinctive look and feel to the fabric they are used to create. 
And some fabric names indicate the types of yarn used to make them. So this is similar to what we we're talking about with weave type, where when I have a specific name of fabric, it will indicate a specific type of yarn was used to make this. And probably the best example of this is crepe fabric. And crepe fabric is uh, specifically named after the crepe yarn, uh, which it is used to create, which is a sort of, it's a little bit complicated here, a little, at least looks a little bit complicated here, but crepe yarns, um, so as you can see, all yarns when they're formed are twisted, and they're either twisted this way, um, which when looked at <laughs> from the side is either a uh, Z twist or a S twist, and I don't really wanna get into that too much right now, um, it, the Z twist or the S twist really just refers to in what direction clockwise or counterclockwise the fibers are spun um, or subsequently plied. Um, and they're not quite as important to know as some of the other sort of yarn types, but just know that all yarns are formed by twisting the fiber into a yarn in either a clockwise um, pattern or a uh, counterclockwise pattern, which are an S twist or Z twist. Um, again, Z twist, S twist, you aren't, you're not gonna typically see that in, a, in fabric information because it's not quite as important um, as some of the other characteristics when it comes to yarn. Um, so let's just talk about first about the twisting so yarns can be twisted really, really tightly and really, really high to have a high twist, or they can be twisted kind of loose and have a low twist. And this matters because that is one of the biggest factors into whether a fabric will be soft, limp, flowy, drapey, low twist, or stiff, bunchy, scrunchy, um, and have you know uh, 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 a lot of stiffness uh, to it, and that would be a high twist. So again, yarns that are twisted l lowly or loosely will flow and flutter and drape and be quite limp and soft. Um, yarns that are twisted quite tightly um, or have a high twist are going to be much stiffer, um, scrunchier, uh, uh, stiffer, uh, uh, things like that have a lot more, you know, uh, structure to them. Um, and Next, we're gonna also talk about plied yarns. Plied yarns is very important to know. So when a yard is plied or a fabric is plied, uh, so if I talk about a two-ply fabric, um, I'm specifically talking about the yarn. Um, now this image is a three-ply yarn. And when we talk about plies, um, we create a plied yarn by taking two or more finer yarns and twisting them together to create a single plied yarn. So here we see the creation of a three ply yarn. So three individual yarns are being twisted together to create one denser plied yarn. In this case, a three plied yarn. Now we do this um, because very fine yarns uh, with sort of high quality, tightly twisted, um, a lot of times even like thin, um, fine yarns are very thin, so it can be difficult to make thicker, denser fabric out of it. Um, so when we want to create fabrics that utilize very fine um, yarns and keep that feeling kind of smooth, keep uh, the actual sort of thickness of the fabric down, but we want weightness, uh, I'm sorry, um, we want weight and density to the fabric, uh, we're gonna use plied yarns so that it keeps the overall fabric relatively thin, not, I mean, again, it's hard to say thin, it, the same, but it's it's denser, it's, it's thicker, it's heavier, um, and we can use these fine yarns in very lovely ways. It's it, plied yarns, especially plied silks, are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, like a four plied silk has just lovely drape, lovely movement. Uh, the added weight and density to it uh, makes it sort of move and bounce around really beautifully. 
Um, so it's it's the way of of it, the plaid yarn plaid yarns are usually a little bit more luxy, um, and they're going to give you a fabric that again is 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 denser, not always thicker, but denser, um, and uh, uh, can be warmer or um, more durable and things like this. Then there's a, a number of sort of like novelty yarns down here. So here's a looped yarn. Um, and we'll see that in fabrics like boucle. So like I was talking about before, how some fabric names will indicate the types of yarns used to make them. Um, the looped yarn is, uh, can also be called a boucle yarn and it's used in boucle fabric. Um, and you can identify boucle fabric uh, by looking at the surface and seeing these little tiny looped yarns within it. Uh, same thing with slub. So a slubbed yarn is a yarn with irregular thickness. They'll have big, thick, fat parts and thinner parts. And they give a sort of uh, characteristic texture, slubbing texture to fabrics like Shantung or Dupioni um, or other, other different fabrics. So again, when I say the word Dupioni or Shantung, I am implying that slubbed yarns are used. That's part of the definition of the fabric is that these types of yarns are used. And I, I forget whether I, I didn't finish, sorry, I, I apologize. I didn't finish with my definition of crepe yarn. So crepe fabrics can be made out of wool, cotton, pretty much anything. You typically are gonna see it out of silk and wool for the most part. Um, but you can also see knits out of crepes and the crepe specifically again refers to the crepe yarn. And the crepe yarn is uh, created by twisting a yarn in two different directions. So remember how I said that when we create a yarn, we are either spinning the fiber clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, in crepe yarns, we do both. We spin for a little ways in a clockwise direction, and then we spin a little ways in a, in a counterclockwise, and we do it in a way that it doesn't just untwist. Um, but what happens is the yarn itself kind of gets like kinky and curly, um, and when we make crepe fabrics, it gives this really subtle, beautiful, um, pebbly texture to the face. Um, and it also helps kind of give a nice sort of watery flowing drape Crepe fabrics have a really, really lovely drape um, and flow to them, which is aided by this um, alternating between the S and Z twist. Um, and again, so that's our crepe yarn. Uh, one more just to go over. Again, there's many, many different types of yarn. I just want to kind of go over just a few of them so you're not left in the dark when some of the most popular terms in, in terminology is used. Um, down here is a, is a pile yarn. Uh, sometimes these are called chenille yarns, especially when they're made out of cotton. Um, and they are yarns with fluffy stuff. So we can see this with chenille fabrics. Again, chenille yarns are like this. Any kind of fluffy um, uh, fabric, it's used to give volume and softness and things like that. Sometimes they're used in corduroy or fabrics that we consider have sort of a bit of a uh, pile or uh, fluff to them. Now, also in my yarn tips, I haven't done this specifically, but if you do not have a weight for your knit fabric, you're probably going to want to list a yarn gauge. And the yarn gauge, um, when referring to knit fabrics, tells us how thick the yarn is you, uh, that was used to make the knit fabric. So smaller gauges um, or thinner gauges are going to create a thinner, uh, more fine knit. Uh, thicker gauges are going to give us a, a thicker, chunkier knit. Um, and if you have both of those things, both weight and yarn gauge, fantastic. But for a knit fabric, you should have at least one. Fabric finishes. Fabric finishes are processes uh, applied to fabrics after they have been wo woven. Um, so we have the piece of fabric and there's something else we want done to it and we put it through a process and basically these finishes will have two purposes. One is purely for looks and the other is for performance. Um, and again, they can have a variety of impacts on how the fabric looks and behaves. Um, so let's take a look at some of just the most basic finishes that we can see. Um, first, I'm gonna start with denim because almost all denim has gone through some sort of finishing. 
Um, and you can Google all sorts of denim finishes because there's way more than even this. And then even on top of the actual fabric being finished in a certain way, once jeans are made, they'll typically go through a distressing process. Um, so that can mean any from everything from putting those rips in to putting specific like, um, let's say, I wanna say, I don't wanna use the word stain, but that's typically what they do. So like if you have those, the, the creases that you can see, the sort of patterns of creases from the, like the fade of the dye, those are actually applied in um, uh, sanding to soften some of the seams and pockets. Um, basically just making it look a little bit more used, softening it up a bit, things like that. But again, these are just specifically done to the fabrics and different um, methods used and what it ends up looking like. So we can treat our denims with stones, with bleach, with sand, with enzymes, with dirt, um, dye, all sorts of different things. Um, and again, this is for mostly visual reasons, but a lot, especially the sandblasting and bleaching and stonewashing will soften the fabric considerably. It makes it limper and, and softer and fuzzier to the touch. Um, so that would be also for performance because it's just more comfortable. Um, here we have a couple other different um, finishes. Also down here, I, I, there is one very common, I tried to get the most common ones, but for a lot of fabrics, we'll see a brushed finish, and that goes along, it's very similar to a sandblast or a stone wash, and the brushed finish literally takes a, a giant, giant scrubber brush with little tiny fine uh, wires and brushes it over the surface of the fabric, and this again is the same kind of uh, uh, idea of a sandblasting, and it's just to soften the fabric a lot of times it raises a little bit of a fuzzy pile, makes it softer. Uh, the softness of flannel is, is, is created this way. So flannel technically uh, means that it has been brushed um, or something like that. So that's what brushing means. It's a very common finish. I didn't include it here, but I'm talking about it now. Uh, another less common, maybe I should have replaced it here, is a moiré. Um, that is a finish that is applied by giant... Uh, metal rollers with this kind of pattern put on it and a lot of steam and caustic soda is used um, and it creates this sort of watery wood like uh, wood grain like pattern um, and it's typically applied to taffeta or a synthetic version of taffeta um, where the sort of shine or gloss of the fabric gets patterned uh, by these rollers and sometimes it's called water silk because the pattern is supposed to look like water. I think it looks like wood grain, but that's what they call it. Um, sometimes blisters, textures, or puckers are applied by heat, caustic soda. That is also would be considered a finish. So here's a nice example of a, a blistered or puckered fabric uh, that was finished this way. It's not woven this way, but was finished either with heat treatment or, or chemical treatment or, or caustic soda treatments uh, to create these puckers. Um, down here, I also have something here to represent some of the more functional. Um, again, these are all up here, pretty visual, but this is a bit more performance. We finish our fabrics um, with different chemical finishes to make them uh, stain resistant or stain proof, to make them water resistant or waterproof. Uh, uh, and now different technologies are coming out and you've probably seen in a lot of your active wear, oh, it's antimicrobial. Um, so they have different chemical finishes to inhibit the growth of bacteria and other microorganisms that might make your clothing smell. Um, and even with COVID, uh, that kind of popped up for a while. Oh, anti antibacterial clothing and masks and blah, 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 blah. Um, but that's, again, another type of finishing uh, that we can put on there. And again, also anti-wrinkle. Some fabrics have uh, different sort of heat or chemical treatments to them to make them le uh, more resistant to wrinkling. Country of origin. Okay, country of origin for fabrics can be very important. Um, it's not always necessary, uh, not like a lot of this other stuff but it's always really good to know, especially for our conscientious designer. Um, it can help a designer ensure fair labor standards and quality insurance relating to the production of their materials. 
So when it relates to fair labor standards, some countries have regulatory standards for their labor markets. So if you know you are purchasing fabric, if you know human rights and labor rights are important to you, you're going to want to buy fabrics uh, from countries with a robust um, regulatory standards for their labor markets, which means they've passed laws and legislation that protect workers' rights, um, if that's important to you. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not important to some people. Um, but if it is, that's what you're going to want to know. <laughs> but it's also important for quality insurance. So some countries just have a very long history and reputation for creating beautiful types of fabrics. Uh, China is known for their silk. Uh, the Middle East is known for their cottons. Um, uh, Egypt for cotton and linen, sort of in there, you know, different um, areas of the world have their own sort of fabric specialty. So if you know, if you want a particular type of fabric and it's coming sort of from its homeland, so to speak, or its home region, uh, you have a little bit more insurance of its quality. Um, uh, and a lot of countries also will set their own uh, quality standards for their fabrics. So um, if you know the country of origin, you can make sure all of those things are aligned, uh, aligned to give you a little bit better feeling about um, you know, the quality of the fabric itself and also um, if fair labor practices were used in the creation of your fabric. And that's it. So I hope that that was helpful to you. Um, and again, I just, I just really wanna reiterate how important it is to know about your fabrics. Um, Sometimes it can seem a little tedious and overwhelming because there are so, 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 so many different types of fabrics. Um, but if you take it a little at a time, a little bit of a time, maybe try to focus on one little piece of fabric a day, um, it's really, really going to help you as a designer to understand what fabrics are going to be best suited for the garments that you want to create. You know, do, from movement to performance to cost, it's all in there. Um, uh, knowing your fabrics is absolutely, absolutely essential for every fashion designer. There's really no way around it. Um, and again, like I said, it is. It, there's a big world out there and it's really overwhelming, but just go at it little by little by little. And before you know it, you'll be an expert yourself. So I hope this was a little bit of uh, um, helpful to you, especially those that didn't really understand what the fabric sourcing assignment was supposed to, to get at. Hopefully this gives you a little bit better idea now of what really went wrong with your fabric assignment or fabric sourcing assignment. Um, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me. Bye-bye. Um,